What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast, the daily podcast where we break down Mad Max one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we are talking about Minute 9, which begins with Charlie screaming at Roop to stop, and it ends with Charlie holding the wound in his neck. Huh. Beginning and ending with Charlie. Yeah. I don't feel like this was a great minute for Charlie. I mean, it was a great minute for everybody else except for Charlie. Right. He did a lot of being the passenger and trying to tell Roop things that Roop wasn't listening to. And then getting injured, looks like, pretty severely. Yeah. The first shot of this minute, specifically, we have Charlie yelling at Roop. Roop is hitting Charlie back. They're doing that classic siblings fighting in a car thing and then we get a cut to march hare which is close behind the night rider on the road and sars is literally hanging out the window waving at people to get off the road i thought that was unprofessional it seems a little goofy the interceptors have a loudspeaker on the top of the car yeah I mean, it's a standard issue for police cars in general it can't just be used for the siren noise. They should be able to hold up a like a handpiece or something and use that horn to instruct people. So it, it feels kind of, like you said, goofy that he would hang out the side of a vehicle in order to wave people off the road. Speaking of doofy, I thought it was kind of funny. One of the people he told to stay off the road just fell down. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. I think, were they riding a bike? I don't believe they were riding it a bike. It was really I didn't see quick. One. Yeah. And once again... Old and grainy, and hard, yes. to, hard to see exactly what was going on. But you could see that they just fell down. Mm -hmm. So my first thought when I saw Sars hanging out the window and waving at people to stay off the road, my thought was, well, the Knight Rider's already passed. The pursuit has already gotten by those people, so why would they need to stay off the road? And then I remembered it's not just the Knight Rider and Sars. It's also Roop and Goose are back yeah. there in the race. And if he's warning anybody, he's not warning them about Goose. He's warning them about Roop because... Because people should be warned about Roop. Yeah. The car is barely holding together at as is, and with his erratic driving, the possibility of people getting hurt because of him, very high. Yes, as we have already seen and will continue to see. Mm -hmm. From seeing Sars hanging out the window, we cut over to Big Bopper, which is making just the most awful ticking sound. Mm -hmm. You mentioned last minute about the whole, my car doesn't start whenever it breaks down type of thing. And this minute, that car isn't really running again. It's it's functioning, but to say that it's truly running, I think is giving it a little little credit. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so Sars yells out the window to get off the road, mm -hmm. and I found this very humorous. Mm-hmm. We cut back to inside a Big Bopper, and Charlie is kind of in a panic. Oh, and yeah. And he is saying, get off the road, get off the road. And Roop is telling him to shut up, hitting him. So he's, I feel like he's kind of gone into uh, civilian mode, mm -hmm. where he has been told by the police to get off the road. He should get off the road. He wants to get off the road. And in that panic, he's just, that's what he wants to do, is get off the road. And he's got a, he's got a big point about... Absolutely! He's got a big point about staying off the road in that that vehicle, it should not be con continuing this pursuit. It has sustained damage to the point that they should stop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So after we see Big Bopper on the road, we get another shot of Goose catching up and... I like this transition because we get an exterior shot of Big Bopper and they kind of drift over to the right side of the shot and you can see Goose's headlight behind and then it kind of zooms in on Goose to let us know that that is actually him mm -hmm. catching up. I couldn't help but notice that Goose spends this entire chase catching up. Yes. And we mentioned, you know, he should have really been more attentive to his radio and ready to get on there. Because if he had been ready, stationed around Fat Nancy's, he would have been able to join right up with March Hare and Big Bopper. But where he saw them drive by, then had to get on the bike, then had to get past the tow trucks. Yeah, he spends all this time catching up. Yep. Doing very little. And in fact, by the end of this minute, he's out of the game. Exactly. We cut from Goose back to your favorite character. Oh, the kid. The toddler. Yep, running right down, conveniently running right down the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, then we, we jump to inside Knight Rider's car where, okay, so in my notes, I have it the Knight Rider's floozy, referencing when, uh, when Rube called him the Skagans floozy. But in my research for a future minute, I found out her name. It's Marmaduke. I actually have a lot to say about that in later minutes, the, so okay. we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. So I'm going to call her Marmaduke. Okay. And we'll talk about it later, but I don't want to call her floozy if I know her name. Yes. So. Marmaduke sees the kid and starts to warn Knight Rider. He doesn't care. He actually hate this part. I love it and I hate it. He does this tongue wagging growling thing that is so gross. It's so gross. And he seems to be taking pleasure in heading towards the kid in the thought of hitting the child. But he has ample opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. The kid is running directly away from him, right down the middle of the road. He's a sitting target. He could hit him if he wants to, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. I think he should get a little bit of credit for that. (laughs) A little bit. So that toddler is played by Matthew Constantine, who has an IMDb page. Okay. And the fact that he has an IMDb page made me wonder if he has any other acting credits to his name. Uh, He doesn't. (laughs) His... Singular role is the toddler from Mad Max, and that's the only bit of show business he's ever done. Now, despite that fact, there's a website called filmbase.org. They gave Matthew Constantine the following biography on their website. This is the bio under his name on the website. It says... Actor Matthew Constantine prefers to play in movie genres such as action, adventure, drama, sci-fi, thriller. Matthew Constantine was lucky to work with talented film directors such as George Miller. Wow, that is very leading. Mm -hmm. From that, you would assume that Matthew Constantine continued working in films. Absolutely. But no, it he never worked in another movie, never worked on another TV show, as far as IMDb is concerned. Which IMDb pulls some pretty obscure stuff. Yes, I've I've never found IMDb lacking. So I think they're fairly trustworthy. I wonder if that bio might have been written by Matthew Constantine as he was an older individual, but I'm not gonna come right out and say that's exactly what it was, because it's pure speculation. <laughs> So, going back to Knight Rider's girl, I think her worry at the possibility of hitting the toddler is a bit telling about her character, that she's not quite as crazed or necessarily on something as the Knight Rider may be, as we discussed in a previous minute. I think when I mentioned that she's feeding off of his energy, I think that's exactly it, because she kind of realized the situation they were in and kind of had to take a quick step back and be like, oh no, this is happening. But as you mentioned, we get some quick cuts of Toddler, then goes to the Knight Rider and March Hare side by side. We see a shot of the guy in the pickup, the arguing couple turn to see the car speeding past the toddler. It's this very quick sequence. Yes. So leading up to it, though, so we see the Knight Rider. The shot shifts to in front of the Pursuit Special, which shifts closer to the center line. We see the car drifting towards the center line as if the car was going to hit the toddler. We don't see the Knight Rider cross the center line. Instead, the camera cuts to the toddler in a tighter shot than the one before with kind of a, a short zoom effect to kind of give the illusion of something going towards him. And then we see the POV shot of the toddler, which is low to the ground, center of the road. Mm -hmm. And we can see that the Knight Rider has crossed the center line and is now running alongside March Hare. Now, because of these quick cuts and a high energy action scene, as a normal viewer, you can just disregard the fact that he went from one tire being close to the center line to the entire car being over the center line. But where we're dissecting this so closely, I found that transition from being on one side of the line to completely on the other to be rather jarring of a jump because it was so quick. It just, I didn't feel like the continuity was there in Mm -hmm. the time between the shots and I don't know it stood out to me as a little bothersome so they really set up that scene to tell you that they hit the child Mm -hmm. you believe it the sound of the mother screaming the the guy in the camper what did he say I can't remember what he said he just said oh no or something yeah he he noticed the situation and showing Knight Rider crossing the line they really they want you to believe that they hit the kid Mm -hmm. the shot where they actually drive by the toddler Mm-hmm. Obviously, they replaced the toddler with a dummy because no toddler is oh. going to stand still in the middle of a road. Right. And might I add that if that were if that really happened, if they if really it was a toddler, two car.
cars whizzed right by him. The wind from those two cars would have, I don't know, done something to the kid. Oh, yeah, definitely. At least, like, knocked him, knocked him over. He would have yeah. been scared. He would have been crying at the very least, if not something really bad happening to him, being injured by being thrown by the wind or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. the cars speed by, yes. and you actually, there actually is a thud sound effect. Yes. So, for all intents and purposes, this toddler got hit, and then. The fact that the woman on the side of the road screams the way she does, they want you to think this kid got hit. However, they do an immediate reverse shot from the rear window of Knight Rider's car, and you can see the toddler toddling off the road. Mm -hmm. Aside from the toddler getting off the road, you can also see that March Hare's kind of swerving a little bit, as if to show that they did a little swerve maneuver to get around the toddler. Right. They actually tried to go around the toddler. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite as driving in parallel as they made it seem. Yes. It's interesting because I would also say that Knight Rider moved to not hit the kid because he could have hit the kid if he had wanted to. So that tells me he purposely didn't. But Knight Rider continued on just fine while March Hare went off the road. This kind of goes back to, I want to say, the end of minute seven. We saw that establishing shot of the woman crossing the road, the caravan, driving up the road and then we saw the phone booth with a pile of construction debris in front of it and there's a board on a pile of dirt that makes a makeshift ramp and so based on the geography of that scene as we've established in previous minutes just by them being on that side of the road they were going to hit that debris no matter what it's just the fact that they had swerved to avoid the kid and immediately after avoiding the kid scuttle is turned back instead of keeping his eye on the road so sars tells him to watch out he spins around He's able to swerve enough to just graze the phone boat, but that makeshift ramp is literally right there. There's no way to avoid it, and so their tire goes up, they flip over, and then they slide on their hood for a while. Yes. Well, they slide on their roof for a while, not the hood, the roof. (laughs) I want to point something out. The shots are pretty quick, so Mm -hmm. it was really hard to notice, but the kid doesn't get hit. Yep. And March Hare is setting up to hit the phone booth and the ramp then flip they do like a quick establishing shot at the phone booth this is prior to when they hit the phone booth if you stop on that shot you can see their interceptor that they are driving currently upside down right in front of the camper really yes Hmm. it is there and i like looked for a long time i made sure that what i was seeing was what i was seeing and the interceptor that they are driving in that quick shot is over by the camper upside down I missed that one. It was pretty quick. Yeah. This accident here is pretty much the last time we see Sars. In a later minute, we'll catch a little glimpse of Scuttle in the background. Mm -hmm. But this is the last time we see Sars. So I think this is a good time to bring up Stephen Clark and his work that he's done in show business. Yes. So Stephen Clark, who plays Sars, has five credits on IMDb. He did three movies, including Mad Max... He also did Thirst in 1979, credited as Barman, and the pirate movie in 1982, where he played Policeman. Didn't we already bring up the pirate movie? Oh, yeah. Who who was that? Do we need to watch the pirate movie? Oh, I do not want to watch the pirate movie. Why not? Just because it's a 1982 pirate movie, and it seems ridiculous. Okay. (laughs) So the other person who was in the pirate movie was Clive Hearn, who was the truck driver who said, Struth, they're at it again. He's the first person in this movie that was also in the pirate movie. Stephen Clark played a policeman in the pirate movie. And George Novak, who played Scuttle, is also a unnamed pirate in the pirate movie. In the pirate movie. So you know how they have that old standby that Britain only has so many actors Uh and they play in everything? Yes. Same goes for Australia. Yeah. Especially in the mid to early 80s. (laughs) <laughs> Aside from those movies, Stephen Clark also did two TV shows. He did one episode of Prisoner Cell Block H in 1979, and he did two episodes of Skyways in 1979 as well. So he had a pretty short career. Yeah, it seems everything is uh, in a pretty tight time frame. Kind of like a, a three-year span of time. So George Novak, on the other hand, who played Scuttle, has a much longer career. He's done stunt work for several movies, including Mad Max, and he actually appears twice in the credits. He appears once next to his character name, and he appears again as part of the stunt team. 
the latest credit on his acting list was a 2002 movie named Rain in Darkness. It's a vampire movie, obviously, <laughs> the name like that, where he just played a bum in okay. the background of one scene or something like that. Okay. I really didn't dig too much into Rain in Darkness mm-hmm. because, you know, it's a vampire movie and it just does not hold any interest for me at okay. all. As I mentioned before, he played an unnamed pirate in the pirate movie. <laughs> and before working on Mad Max, Novak had one other role in 1975 as unnamed car chaser in a movie called The Box. Okay. Yep. Uh, do you think Sars and Scuttle survived the crash? Well, okay, no. I should reword the question. Okay, so we see Scuttle later on. Do you think Sars survived that crash? It looked pretty bad. I'm trying to think how the roll happened. So they hit the ramp. On the right side tire, the car spins counterclockwise, lands on the roof. Sars would be on the side of the car that hit the floor first, and then the car continued to slide on that side of the roof. It did level out at some point as it was sliding, but in universe, I think it's pretty safe to say that Sars does not survive this car accident just based on how mobile he is in the car it makes sense that he would not be wearing a seatbelt. Okay. So there would be nothing holding him in place as that car is sliding or flying through the air or spinning. There would be nothing holding him in the car Mm -hmm. out of danger. Now, granted, everything in that car is in danger because it's flying through the air, but... Okay. Yeah, I don't think Sars survives this one. Well, that's a shame. It is. So after the... Interceptor flips over and slides on its roof for a while. We see a shot of the woman from the arguing couple grab her toddler and pull him off the road right as Roop is coming up the road. We get a reaction shot from Charlie. That is priceless. Yep. This reaction shot is so much better than the reaction shot we got for the blue van crash. Yeah, like the double take. It's... So much more expressive and so much more frenzy. Just amazing expression work as they are careening headlong towards this caravan that is blocking the road. And the way they crash through it, it's it makes me really upset that they didn't have super slow-mo cameras back in 1979. I feel like this shot of Big Bopper flying through the caravan would make an amazing episode of slow-mo guys. Absolutely. Oh, they should totally do that. I'm not sure they have the budget for something like that, though. They usually stay pretty small scale. They'd have to partner with someone. They would. They'd have to, A, find a caravan. Or find a trailer, a camper. They'd have to find a camper. They'd have to completely gut the inside of that camper. Then they'd have to find a car. And set up the ramp and drive the car through it, obviously. It would be a lot of logistics and a lot of money. Well, I'm sure there's people out there on YouTube who, like, perform stunts. Mm -hmm. And they could partner with somebody like that who knows how to do stunts like that. There is a film it in slow-mo. There's a video that I found on YouTube as I was preparing for this minute of a bunch of guys with a car and a camper, and they drove it through. From the looks of it, they didn't have the right angle of ramp set up. Mm -hmm. because the car didn't fly through the trailer quite the same way that it does in the movie. But, you know, just a bunch of guys in a field with a camera, a car, and a camper, and they just drove right through it. Mm -hmm. I think they were doing tests for some sort of tribute video or something like that. I didn't pay attention too much to the original poster or the dates or anything like that. Oh, just the amount of pieces and debris of the camper just... Everywhere all over the road. It's it's, spectacular. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There's a reason why we chose it for for the banner of our Facebook page and our web. Oh, absolutely. Beautiful shot. It really is. After Charlie and Roop go through the camper, we get a quick shot of Knight Rider and his girl turning back to survey the carnage that they've inflicted. And then they they start driving off. We finally see Goose directly enter the chase. Yeah, so... This is what I have in my notes. Knight Rider sees all of this, meaning the carnage, and continues fleeing with Goose now the only one in pursuit. I immediately wrote underneath it. 
Never mind. Goose falls over for no apparent reason. So, as a writer, I was yes. a, I have a couple of observations about this scene. First and foremost, the rule of thumb when it comes to do you lay your motorcycle down or do you stay upright on both wheels, the rule of thumb is you never lay your bike down. Yeah. Because a modern motorcycle has the brakes and the tires and the regulating systems in check so that you are better equipped to handle a quick stop and obstacle avoidance scenario by staying upright. The second you drop that bike, you've lost a large percentage of your traction. And so I thought of this as I was watching Goose take this maneuver. You'll notice as you're watching the minute that the first time you see him, both of his tires are are smoking. So he's already locked up his front and rear brakes. Those tires are no longer spinning. They are just skidding along the ground. At that point, he's so close to the truck that if he had not locked his brakes, he may have had the opportunity to drive around the truck. But I noticed that there's a big old concrete lip on the edge of the road of a sidewalk that we saw back in minute seven when they did the wide shot. Yes. The woman pushing the stroller had to go had up to over go the curb. Up and over. Yeah. So, Which might not bother a car so much, but a motorcycle, yeah. different story. So the fact that the truck was trying to turn around and had the bumper right up against that sidewalk, there was no way that Goose could have made that jump. Because that was a good, I'd say, two, three inches of concrete. And that's a lot for a motorcycle to handle, especially if you're coming it at the angle that he did. So with both tires locked up, no way to get around the front of the pickup truck. The only way for him to minimize damage to the pickup truck was for him to drop the bike. And so he drops the bike down towards the left so that he's kind of skidding along the ground with his left leg under the bike, right leg, top of the bike. And then he <laughs> he, slid, he slides up to the pickup truck and then he kind of slams on the side of it with his hand to just make the final stop. And the fact that he didn't completely wreck the side of that pickup truck is kind of a testament to his ability as a rider, considering that he was just in a bad situation altogether. Yeah, that's a very good point. Out of the the three vehicles that we've seen so far in action, the motorcycle and and Goose are the only ones that really come out of this well. Everybody else is completely destroyed. The only one not injured, Roop isn't injured, right? miraculously. He's actually the only one not injured. Um, but other than that fact, both cars are completely destroyed. The motorbike, yeah, it's, it's going to be banged up, but probably not that bad. So considering what could have happened, he, it seems he was the most intelligent about how to handle the situation he was in. And and you mentioned when we first met Goose a couple of minutes ago that primarily he was hired because he was a motorcycle rider. He did joke that that was the motivating factor in him getting hired. Yeah, so I think maybe in this scene right here we see the evidence of that. Mm-hmm. After Goose stops sliding, the man in the pickup truck, who is, <laughs> as we said last time, credited as the driver, but that is <laughs> not the case because the steering wheel is on the other side, but he leans out the window and asks Goose what's going on. Now, <laughs> I love this part. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy in the script between what I hear him saying and what the script says that he says. Oh. The man in the truck says, oh my god, what happened? Goose, from what I hear, says, well, hello there, I just got here myself. Oh, no, that's not what I heard at all. What did you hear? I heard, hell if I know, I just got here myself. That makes a lot more sense, actually. But I love the fact that that's his response. (laughs) Yes, it's quite amusing. And he's laughing while he's saying it. He's not in that much pain. (laughs) Yeah. He's not that injured because he's still laughing and joking. Mm -hmm. So after Goose and the truck driver have their little interaction there, we cut over to Big Bopper, which is wrecked in a field. We get another line from the truck driver, who is not the truck driver. He's just the man in the car. We get a, a line from him where he says, I think he broke his leg. And then... The woman, credited as the caravan driver's wife, but she's the driver of the caravan, says, I want to find out what's happened. So those are the last two lines we hear before we get up to the actual cab of Big Bopper and we can see Roop and Charlie through the window where Charlie is holding a wound that he's got on his neck. And uh, Roop reaches up to turn on the radio. And we're going to talk more about that wound in the next minute. Yep. Our website 
is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at madmaxminute and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash madmaxminute. Thank you for joining us for Mad Max Minute number nine. See you tomorrow. Motorbikes and leather men Take me to the end of the dream Hold on tight, so it's short, Bill.